<laughs> We're on 46, page 884. What is this? Those are Canadian geese. Geese migration. We're on the Atlantic Flyway right here. Interesting. Yeah, well, I see a lot of those coming through. My golf course superintendent doesn't like them. <laughs> um, where's my globe? That's up front by the fan. Okay, we're learning about the different environments that there are on the Earth. And um, one thing that we know is that the Earth is, uh, is round. And not only is it round, um, it spins. And it is tilted in its orbit around the sun. So it's got a tilt to it. And the sun is this very bright star that's um, millions of miles away, and it shines light on the Earth. Now, the, the part of the Earth that's directly facing the sun gets pretty direct light. But because the Earth is a, is a sphere, part of it, because it, it turns like this, on the area that's kind of facing away from the light, the light is hitting at an angle, not straight on. And the light is spread out over a much larger area. So the same amount of light is spread out over a large area near the top of the curve, where it's spread out over a small area. If the light's coming from this way, this, this I take a small width of area here. That's fine. Small width of area here heats up this much land versus if it hits high on the globe, it spreads out and heats up a much larger amount of land. So this area is going to be cooler than this area because it's getting a lot less energy. The energy spread out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, different types of the year, different parts of the land are facing the sun. Let's say the sun is where this podium is. Because the Earth has a tilt to it, the tilt is only is 23 degrees, by the way. But because it has a tilt to it, in the winter, the northern hemisphere is faced away from the sun. But in the summer, the northern hemisphere is faced toward the sun. So you have what's called seasons. You see what I'm saying? So, winter, southern hemisphere facing the sun. Summer, northern hemisphere facing the sun. And then you have your fall and your spring. Summer, fall, winter, <coughs> spring. There's something inside my globe right now. It's annoying. If, if there was no tilt to the earth, you wouldn't have any seasons. Really? Every, wouldn't matter where it is, nothing's closer to the sun than any other time. Was that? But it is kind of cool that in January, it's real cold here. In January in Australia, it's real hot. Mm. Summer in, uh, oh, oh, Christmas in Australia is a lot different. Do North American and South American have seasons? Have what? No, because in the northern hemisphere, the uh, in the in January, the southern part of the globe is faced towards the sun, so it's hot in South America in January, and it's cold in North America in January. Does that make sense? So, so ideally, if you had all the money in the world, you would want a house in the northern hemisphere and a house in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> Then and you could fly back and forth, and you could always be whatever temperature you want. Yeah. Right? 
Can you, it's on the equator. There's, is there any change of seasons? In the noted? equator, there's very little change of seasons. That's correct. Hey, visits from your house is open. Uh, straight up and down. Till. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you're here sitting in the northern hemisphere. The poles. This is, this is how it, how it, the axis of rotation is tilted. Is what we say. Oh. Mm -hmm. So here's the axis of rotation here. Now it's okay. yeah. yeah. So does the distance to the sun change by season? Are we closer in spring and no. spring and well, fall? Well, yeah, slightly. Slightly. Okay. It's actually uh, it's, an elliptical. it's a bit of an elliptical, what we call yeah. an elliptical orbit, orbit yeah. and we're actually closer, a little bit closer to the sun mm -hmm. in our winter. Yeah. And we're further from the sun in our summer, summer. but yeah. the. The distance is so little that it makes mm -hmm. very little difference yeah. in the temperature. Yeah. So it's not it's that actually much, yeah. hotter in the southern hemisphere in the summer because sure. we're a little, a little bit closer. closer. Yeah. So so the the summers are a little bit more severe in the southern hemisphere sure. than they are in the northern. Yeah. So it's just not by a whole lot. Just it's by not a by a whole lot, but yeah. it might be a degree, degree. which yeah. you know matters. This shows the various uh, winds uh, because of it. There's, there's an effect called the Coriolis effect from the spinning of the Earth that circulates winds. In the northern hemisphere, all the winds tend to turn to the right. And in the southern hemisphere, all the winds turn to, turn to the left, tend to turn to the left. Winds are created by hot air rises like the equator is the hottest, so hot air rises at the equator and then goes outward and then cools off high in the atmosphere and then falls down. So you get kind of a circular weather pattern. It kind of goes like this. And so because of all these weather patterns and uh, in different areas of the globe and different seasons and such, we have different weather on the planet. It depends on the location you're at. You tend to see near the equator, you tend to see a lot of um, rainforests and such, a lot of rain. Because the as the hot air rises and starts to cool, it drops all of its water. So you get a lot of rainfall right around the equator. And therefore, we have a lot of rainforests mm -hmm. around the equator. There's a lot of sunlight there, a lot of energy, and a lot of rainfall. If you go up to about 30 degrees north latitude, or 30 degrees south, you get a lot of deserts in those areas. Because what happens is, the air rises, it drops all of its rain, and then it goes back, and when it falls back down, it's very uh, dry. The air is very dry, and if, when it falls back down to the surface, it takes a lot of the moisture with it. And so um, we see a lot of a lot of deserts at about 30 degrees north and south latitude. Hmm. But we're not a desert, right? No, we're not That's a desert. But that's usually where, about where you see. I see. There are other things. Mountains can cause what's called rain shadows. Have you ever heard of a rain shadow before? Mm -hmm. A mountain can push <coughs> clouds upward. <coughs> and so if you have if you have moist air moving along the surface, this is called wind, with a lot of water. Here's ocean, and coming off the ocean is some wind and wet water, but the, the, this mountain that is formed here pushes the rain upward and all the rain will fall as that air cools. And after it gets over the mountain, it's real dry. And so this area, it has a bunch of dry air coming over. It doesn't have any water. All the water rained on this side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. So we say there's a rain shadow here. And you see that a lot with mountains. Mountains can cause rain on one side, no rain on the other. Hmm. We'll see that a rain shadow is very key in human evolution. Humans probably wouldn't be here without 
this rain shadow effect. I'll talk about that after the AP exam. Why do mountains push the rain up? Uh, just because the slope, the way it is, if the air's coming in here and there's a mountain in the way, it's got to go up. Okay. It's like a ramp. You ever use a bike to jump a ramp? <laughs> you go on this way and there's a ramp there, you got to go up. And it's cooler, higher. If you've ever climbed a mountain, you know that you get real high up on the mountain, it gets cold. I want to go mountain. When the air goes from hot to cool, it the water falls out of it. <coughs> So here's a neat graph here showing all of the different what we call biomes on the planet. And you need to become familiar with this graph. It's on page 886. <coughs> and this graph shows the two main factors in determining what biome is present on the Earth. Two main factors are temperature and rainfall or precipitation. And in this graph, they put rainfall on the bottom and temperature on the side. But I've seen the same graph with temperature on the bottom and rainfall on the side. It doesn't matter which way you do it. But if we have high rainfall, which is over here on the right, and high temperature, which the way they've done this graph, high temperature is on the bottom, which is kind of a weird way of doing it. You normally see temperature going higher on the top, but here they've done high temperature on the bottom. I'm not sure why they do it that way, but often you see this graph that way. So what do we have if it's high temperature and high rainfall? Tropical rainforest. Do you all see? Uh -huh. you might, they might put this graph on the test and just have you be able to read it. Write down the answer to this question. See if you can get it right. Don't yell it out. What kind of biome do you have if you have low temperature, low rainfall? Don't yell it out. Low temperature, low rainfall. That's number one. Number two, what if you have medium temperature, Medium rainfall. Number three, medium temperature, low rainfall. Number four, very low temperature, high rainfall. And finally, number five, high temperature, low rainfall. Reading a graph. you got to be able to do that, AP Bio. Okay, what was number one? Tundra. What was the question? Low temperature, low rainfall. Low temperature, low rainfall is what? Tundra. Tundra. How many got tundra? I did. Yay. Tundra you see up here at the high uh, latitudes. Hmm. We'll talk about tundra. Yeah. Does snow count, though? Uh, they don't even put snow. snow. Polar yeah. ice is yeah. not really a biome, but there it is. Yeah, but when, like, when it gets cold enough for the rain to turn into snow, like, all yeah, year round. Yeah, that counts as precipitation. Okay. I guess. I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I guess not, because it's nowhere in the graph. Yeah. High precipitation, so snow doesn't count. What was the second one? Uh, medium temperature, medium precipitation. And what did y'all put? Tempered deciduous forest. Tempered deciduous? Anyone get that? I did. What does deciduous mean? Deciduous means changing. So forests that like drop their leaves are deciduous forests, where the leaves totally drop from the tree. Yeah. Basically like the eastern That's United States. That's pretty close right? to what we are. You go up a little bit north of where we are, you get 
North Carolina and such, you get the changing forests, the deciduous forests, they all drop their leaves in the winter. <coughs> Europe has a lot of that. And then what was the next one? Medium rainfall, high temperature? Uh-huh. Oh, medium temperature, low rainfall. What'd you put? Semi-desert. Medium temperature, low rainfall. Semi-desert? Or did you anyone put shrubland? Or woodland? Or maybe grassland somewhere in there? Semi-desert? Shrubland. Shrubland? Okay, good. Medium rainfall, no, medium temperature, low rainfall. And what was the next question? Uh, low temp and high rainfall. Low temp, high rainfall. I put. That was a trick question. I put none. There's nothing there. You can't have low temp and high rainfall. Because low temp means no rainfall, it's all snow. And then the fifth one, high temp, low rainfall. Desert. Desert. How many put desert for the last one? Yay. Give yourself a good grade. Give yourself a pat on the back. Okay. Okay, put it in the box? No. Okay. <laughs> so there we are. This is our, our map of world biomes. Now, in reality, you see everywhere that's green there is a rainforest, right? But in reality, most of those rainforests are gone. Even right here, uh, Madagascar is a good example, where it's green here. That's supposed to be rainforest. But 90% of that rainforest is gone. 95% of the rainforest. Really? It's all humans and cut the rainforest down. A lot of these places that are supposed to be rainforest are not because of human involvement. Wait, what are we talking about? Um, for, to plant uh, crops. They've, they've cut the rainforest to try and use, the, use it as fields for planting crops. Yeah, It doesn't always work out though, right? It doesn't work very well because that Soil is not, not very nutritious because yeah. all the trees from the rainforest have pulled all the nutrition out yeah. of it. Yeah. And so you only can plant for about a year or two there in the rainforest, and then you have to cut down more rainforest to plant. And yeah. so that's the rainforest quickly disappearing. Why don't we just go somewhere else? Like, there's nowhere else to go. Yeah. That's the problem. There's people everywhere. And those, those people that live in most of those countries on the equator are poor. And they don't have money to go anywhere else and buy land or anything like that. Yeah. So I don't think it's a bad it's, problem that we're worried about losing the rainforest. Yeah. But I don't think it's coincidental that poor people live on the equator. You don't think, think it's coincidental? Yeah. I think there's a reason for it. Oh, sure. Yeah, there's a reason for it. It's kind of like the human population chapter. Yeah. Talked about it, yeah. Right. Um... It's neat, you can see the same sorts of biomes if you just go up a mountain. It goes from tropical forest to deciduous forest to coniferous forest to tundra as the temperature gets colder. So you can see, on a mountain region, there's a bunch of different biomes in just a short amount of space. You can also see this difference as you go from the equator up toward the North Pole you can see, or toward the south pole, you can see a change in, uh, in uh, biome. So you can see increasing latitude as you go to the right, you go through the different biomes. Increasing altitude as you go up, you go have different biomes. That's kind of a neat graph right there. That's kind of an artistic graph. <laughs> Are any of you going to be an artistic biologist? If you like Audubon, that's what he did, right? Just draw uh, the birds. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Or photography. Yeah. So the first area we want to talk about is the tundra. And this starts 46.2. I don't think you have to read all of 46.2 tonight. Yeah, half of it. 
The tundra has, you can see the, the shaded area up here is where the tundra is. Northern Canada, Alaska, Greenland, uh, Siberia, you know, northern Russia. The tundra is so cold up there that the, the, the soil is frozen. There's a layer of frozen soil called permafrost. The, the upper soil thaws out in the summer, but it's frozen in the winter. But the lower soil is constantly frozen. It's called a permafrost layer. And it's so frozen, you can't even dig through it. And so there's just a, a small layer of soil, which grasses can grow in, but trees can't. So there are no trees in the permafrost area, in the tundra. Just grasses. Grasses in the summer. And you have grazers that eat the grasses. A lot of insects up there and such in the summer but then they die out in the winter when it freezes. And then uh, in, the, in the winter, it's all snow. So the tundra is kind of like that. It's somewhat productive. And we're getting more and more tundra as the earth gets warmer. Global warming is bringing more tundra. Really? Yeah, the, uh, some of the frozen areas uh, yeah. are not frozen as long anymore. So the tundra is kind yeah. of increasing in its size. Yeah. Well, isn't the permafrost also melting? Permafrost melting, yeah. That's a big problem. And that's releasing carbon releasing dioxide. Releasing a lot of methane. Yeah. Carbon dioxide, yeah. 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 That's part of global warming, which we'll also talk about. Talk, talk more about global warming after the AP. Hey, a lot of your head turtles swimming around there. Look at those big bears. Brown bear. Those bears will eat you. Be careful around bears. They talk about them in the conservation. <coughs> the extra reading section on page 889 about wildlife conservation. They're trying to collect all the DNA from all the different organisms that are about to go extinct. But maybe with their DNA we can bring them back one day. Like they brought back the... Uh, <coughs> Uh, the woolly mammoth they're working on, but in Jurassic Park, right? Oh, yeah. They brought back the dinosaurs. Not a true story, but theoretically possible. Yeah. I think they'll do it someday. I think so. They're trying to. Trying to bring back the mammoth. Yeah, because they, they found whole bodies frozen in like lakes uh, and stuff. Good, yeah, DNA. DNA, yeah. Now, you go a little bit south of the tundra, and you have the taiga. The taiga are the big coniferous forests. Big pine trees and spruce trees, redwood trees. Actually, I don't think there are red. I don't know if there are any redwood trees up there. But big, big conifers that um, uh, can survive harsh winters. They have needles to protect the uh, snow from gathering on the uh, on the leaves. And uh, they're kind of slow growing, but um, that's what you see in this taiga area. It's also called the coniferous forest. It's where most of our wood comes from on Earth. And you can see most of Canada there, and much of Russia is this big taiga coniferous forest area. Eight. Have you heard of the beetles, Mr. Willis, about the... The bark beetles? Yeah, that yeah. are... That's pretty scary. Bark beetle killing a lot of the pine trees in the world. They're not sure what, why, what's going on. And then here's the temperate deciduous forest. The deciduous forests are trees that drop their leaves every year. Instead of having needles to deal with snow loads, they just say, oh, we're not even going to try to deal with snow loads. <laughs> they drop their leaves, and then when it snows, they don't do anything. They just sit there and wait. They store their food in their roots and in their trunk. And then the next year, after this gets warm again, they grow new leaves. Hmm. And, uh, and so it's very pretty. You get the leaf changes in the deciduous forest. We're getting a little more south now, so we're more productive. So there's more organisms here. There's more photosynthesis goes on, more wildlife, more animals.
And then you go even further south, you get the rainforest. This is areas around the equator where there's lots and lots of rain. In the rainforest, there's so much production, there's so much photosynthesis going on that you see it happen in layers. The top layer is called the canopy. That's where all the leaves are on the trees. But there's a middle layer called the understory where there's epiphytes, plants that live on top of other plants. I took a trip to the rainforest in Ecuador uh, about 10 years ago, maybe it was more than that now, and um, you could see the tree was just covered in these epiphytes. Every tree had stuff living on its bark. Ferns and there's lianas and I'm not sure what that is. Some kind of bromeliad. You got to see all these plants. And then on the on the bottom, the forest floor, you have a bunch of other organisms too. More ferns um, living on the bottom. So it's a layered, we say it's a layered uh, growth pattern. And like I said, the uh, the forests are disappearing. That's a problem. So, have a neat little video. Do we have time for that? No, we don't really have time for it. Look at all these animals in the rainforest. One thing about the rainforest is it's got the highest diversity of wildlife. So you got the most different types of animals and different types of plants. There's a great movie about the rainforest that somebody rented and probably never returned. They're going to keep it forever. It's called Medicine Man. Looks like Stephanie's the one. She's not here. She rented Medicine Man in, on March 13th. So she's had it for a month and a week. Anyway, guy goes to the rainforest and he finds a cure to cancer in the rainforest. They think there's probably, most, most medicines come from plants. And so there's thousands of plants in the rainforest that they have yet to discover. And one might hold the key to curing cancer. And the thing is, he finds the plant, and that rainforest is being cut, you know, by these timber companies. And he's trying to save it. And it's kind of a cool story. It's called Medicine Man. You can rent it on Netflix if you want to watch it. I've got an extra credit movie about it. It's um, Sean Connery. You ever heard of him? Yeah, James Bond. He's, he's, James Bond, yeah. <laughs> he's one of the scientists in the rainforest. But it's cool because it's the whole thing's filmed in the rainforest, so it shows this. Look at that panther. That'll eat you too. That howler monkey, he's not too friendly. The poison arrow frog. You wipe your arrow on the back of that thing and then you shoot somebody and it'll kill them. If you touch frogs, it hurt you. No, but if you were to touch them and then like lick your finger, you'd be in trouble. Or if you had a cut on your finger, your skin will protect you from the poison. But um, dangerous stuff. What? Read through uh, Rainforest tonight. Rainforest, okay. We'll finish it tomorrow. All right. And